I'd like to welcome everyone on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies. We are, I would normally say, very pleased to be here to celebrate the publication two days ago of Maya's notebook. But that would really be a little un incorrect tonight. We're thrilled to be here, and we are thrilled that Isabel Allende, the author of the book, will be here to have a conversation about Maya's notebook, which is, I think, a truly exceptional book. One of its many fine features is parts of it take place right here in Berkeley. <laughs> I'd like to begin by thanking uh, the law school for hosting this event here at the law school, and particularly Dean Christopher Edley for the ways in which he's reached out to Latin America in particular, uh, to Latin America in general, and Chile in particular. And a few brief announcements before we begin. We will be, Isabel Allende will be signing books after the conversation. We ask that people do not use flash photography because of time constraints. There won't be uh, posed photos, but we very much look forward, and she looks forward to signing the books uh, right here after the conversation. Uh, I have been given very direct instructions about what to do tonight. So let me share my responsibilities with you. They are to get off the stage as quickly as I can. <laughs> uh, if I were told this by one Chilena, I would certainly take it seriously. But being told by two, and particularly these two, I will be out of here very quickly. Uh, we, I would like briefly to introduce uh, the two people that will be having the conversation. Beatriz Mantz is a professor here at Berkeley uh, in Ethnic Studies and Geography. She has many awards and other fine things to mention, but she says the highlight of her career for tonight is the fact that she was born and raised about 100 miles from Chiloé. Uh, and that she was in Chile, in southern Chile, a rodeo queen. <laughs> and I am particularly pleased to introduce Isabel Allende, who truly needs no introduction here, reading any of her novels, her nonfiction work, reading a page of anything she's written, gives you a far more eloquent and elegant introduction to who she is than all the awards all the popularity, but there is one dimension, the passion which readers who are familiar with her work approach the appearance of a new work. Please join me in welcoming Isabel Allende. kids for showing up. Um, can you hear me? No. She has, it's, poor Isabel, she has uh, a, a, sore throat. Throat. A, a sore throat. But if you can't hear me, we can heighten up this thing. What about increasing the microphone? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is like the third stop of a book tour that will take a month. And I got sick in the very first event. <laughs> and I have 30 more days to go. <laughs> so I don't know how I'm going to do it. But this raspy voice, I think, is very sexy. I'm trying to, <laughs> I'm trying to study how to preserve the voice, because I think it's really great. Can, anyone, can everyone hear her in the back? No? Yeah. OK, yeah? You can? Yeah. OK. OK. Well, I should also mention, by the way, that I, I wasn't quite hearing what 
Carly was saying, but uh, Isabel has written 19 books. She's a very, very prolific writer. 20. 20, sorry. <laughs> yeah. All right, first correction. We said we were going to have a good time, so you can see. Um, her books have been uh, translated into 35 languages, and she has sold about 57 million copies. That was like two years ago. I'm oh. sure that now it's more. Now with this one, you know, we're going to top the 100 million. <laughs> yeah. um, and I should mention, that, uh, well, innumerable uh, awards. And uh, also, she taught creative writing here, imagine, at Berkeley at one point. What a treat. Yeah, I needed a visa. <laughs> you needed a that, visa. That was before I got an American husband. <laughs> 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 when I found the guy that I could force into marriage, I didn't need to teach anymore. So you were an undocumented uh, immigrant here? Almost. 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 You overextended your visa. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me start this conversation by saying I don't want to give away too much of this book, and I assume most of you uh, have not uh, read it. It's very, uh, in, a, in a typical style, I just find it a wonderful book full of passionate, um, and um, it's a very, very moving uh, book. Um, and I want to ask you, what prompted you to write this particular book? When did the idea first come to you? And why uh, the setting in Berkeley, among other places, Berkeley and Chiloé, which is uh, an archipelago at the end of the world? Why Berkeley and why Chiloé? Well, first, let me tell you what the book is about without giving out too much. It's a story of a 19-year-old girl from Berkeley raised by her grandparents. The grandparents are a grandmother that is very much like me. She's the best character in the book. <laughs> and a grandfather who is an African-American astronomer from the university in Berkeley. And uh, she adores her. her he's the step-grandfather. And when she's 16, she's a normal kid, good grades, athletic. When she's 16, her grandfather dies. The grandmother goes into a depression, and everything falls apart for this girl. She gets in trouble with the wrong friends in Berkeley High. Then she starts shoplifting, drugs, alcohol, whatever, and ends up running away from home in Vegas, where she's uh, recruited by a gang of drug dealers, criminals, and much more than drug dealers. And then the spiral into hell begins. And this nice kid, by age 18 or 17, is a mess, a complete mess, very ill, homeless, desperate. And when she is almost on the verge of dying, her grandmother finds her and rescues her and sends her to the end of the world, the southern tip of the world, the end of Chile, where there is this archipelago called um, Chiloé. Chiloé. Many, many islands, a big island, and many small islands, some of them almost disconnected from the rest of the continent and the world because they are not only remote, but the weather is very bad for many months a year. So during the winter, there are storms, and the weather is so lousy that people are really disconnected. But also, she's persecuted by the FBI, the CIA, the police, the gangsters, the criminals. Everybody's after her. And so the grandmother figures out that that's the place where no one will find her. And, but she has to be hiding. So she cannot use the internet, no tweeting, no, no Facebook, <laughs> no uh, nothing. She has to be really silent. And in that time, where she's in this small community, of 300 people in a small island, she starts learning the lessons that we all learn sooner or later in life. The first lesson that she learns is the law of reciprocity, that you have to give as much as you take. Until that moment, she had been a taker, a person who only receives and expects she's entitled to receive. And she doesn't think that she has the responsibility to give back. And in this community, you really have to participate. And the community embraces her. And so the book goes back and forth between 
the book, the, the journal that she's writing about what happened to her in Vegas and in Berkeley and whatever, and the life that she's having in the island. So it's a, the contrast between the two worlds. And it has the structure of a crime novel. So um, the idea is to create suspense to see what will happen to her. Will she be found? And when she's found, if she is, what will happen to her? But I'm not going to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm curious about, I mean, the, the level of details, um, both about Berkeley uh, and Berkeley High, as well as Chiloé. It makes me uh, wonder how uh, everyone here that knows Berkeley will recognize that. And anyone that has, <coughs> I'm sure most of you have, gone by that park across from uh, Berkeley High will recognize this. And you, I wonder, how do, you, how do you go about to observe so deeply and get that sense, that nuance about a place? Did you hang out outside Berkeley High? I did. You hung out okay, there? I did. Yeah, yeah. And but the same with Chiloé. I mean, I, went I know to Chiloé, Chiloé many, many times. I mean, it, 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 you really get the flavor of the, of the place. You know, if I could research about the slave revolt in Haiti 200 years ago, I can research about Berkeley High. Give me a break. <laughs> it's just a matter of going and hang out there in the, in the high school and with the kids in the park, and you get everything. But also the teachers helped me yeah. a lot. And, um, and in Chiloé, I had been in Chiloé many times, and I have friends that live there. But I, I did a special trip with my husband, my daughter-in-law, and my son. And we spent some time with a very good guide to learn about the mythology of the place, the, the geography, the flora, the fauna, the people, the stories around the stove, everything. Mm -hmm. And um, we really got into the community, which is not what tourists usually right, do. Right. So we really got to know and hear the people talk. And because this place has such a long and harsh winter, People live indoors many months of the year. And the central, the, the heart of the house is an iron stove that is always burning with wood. So there's the smell of wood all over the island. And people sit around the stove, and they drink tea, and they gossip, and they tell stories. And they are, many of the stories are stories of ghosts and of, um, I don't know, wonderful. Wonderful they drink story. mate. They drink and mate. They pass it around. And tea. Yeah. Yeah. I had to particularly laugh about um, the description of the young people here uh, outside Berkeley High. I'm sure you have all seen them, and maybe some of you wear those pants that you, the, the uh, waist is below your tushy somewhere. <laughs> and, uh, and so Isabel describes, and I will never be able to forget this now when I see one of these fellows walking around like that. She says, and they walk around like chimpanzees. With diapers. <laughs> With diapers on, you know. <laughs> that is, is really funny. Um, I was going to ask you if there is anything different about this particular book um, than other books. And the reason why I'm asking is because in the back cover, I have here the original Spanish edition. It's, it says, uh, you say, Esta malla me ha hecho sufrir más que ningún otro de mis personajes. En algunas escenas le habría dado una cachetada para hacerla entrar en razón, y en otras la, habría, la, la habría envuelto... Yeah, please, not everybody speaks Spanish. Sí, I will translate it. <laughs> Pero para los que hablen eh, castellano, la hubiera, la hubiera envuelto en un apretado abrazo para protegerla del mundo y de su propio corazón atolontado. She says, this malla, the, the girl, the 19-year-old, has made me suffer like no other of my characters. In some scenes, I would have slapped her to bring her to her senses. In others, I would have wrapped her in a tight embrace to protect her from the world and from her own foolish heart. So what was about this? Is there anything about this book yeah. that makes it different for you? It's the, the opportunity. I wrote this book in 2010 when all my grandchildren and my grandchildren's friends were teenagers. So I was surrounded by these kids that were, <coughs> that were, excuse me, excuse my voice, 
exposed to all these dangers, and the parents and myself could not protect them at all. And um, Maya, in a way, represents all of them. She has the body of, of one of my granddaughters, the mind of another, the recklessness of another one. So fortunately, all of them now are in college. They are safe. <laughs> but, but I'm telling you, my son lost all his hair trying to contain them for three years. And so, so I wrote it thinking that all these things that Maya goes through mm -hmm. could have happened to any of my grandchildren. So it, I, I suffered with every, everything that happens to her. I, uh, we're going to be taking questions from the audience, and there are going to be uh, some mics. So speak into the mic when we get to that point. But I um, also got some uh, questions and comments from Chile. So I'd like to, and several of them, I won't be able to read them all, but I want to uh, read one that came from uh, Alicia Salinas, who is a poet in Chile, who is the recipient of the Pablo Neruda um, Poetry, National Poetry Award. And in part, she expresses her admiration uh, about you, about you as a writer. She loves your books. Uh, but about this particular book, she asks, do you see yourself reflected in one of the characters, of course. and is one of the characters in the likeness of your husband? No. No. <laughs> no, Popo? No. No. Um, <clears throat> I am the wonderful Nini in the book, <laughs> the grandmother. But Popo, the grandfather, is not my husband. Um, my husband is a grouchy guy <laughs> um, that the grandchildren don't even respect. But Popo in the book is the grandfather that I would have liked to have. He's, he adores Maya unconditionally. Anything she does is perfect for him. Yeah. And he's this big bear of a man. And she finds in him everything, all the love in the world. And it's that love that will sustain her during her descent into hell because she knows that the spirit of the grandfather is watching, is protecting her. And even in the worst moments, when she's, she has almost overdosed in a public bathroom, she, she hears the voice of the grandfather. And so the spirit of the grandfather is always there. All right. Um, let's see if we can take some questions. And while we're getting a, a microphone positioned, I, I want to read a comment that came from Chiloé from Eduardo Rojas. Uh, we here in Chiloé enjoyed very much Isabel Allende's El Cuaderno de Maya. It is truly wonderful that the book in English is being launched in Berkeley, the other site where this novel occurs. So that's a message that's coming all the way from Chiloé. So we'll take a, a question here, and then there will be another one over there. Go ahead. Oh, good evening. Um, I've been reading your books as long as there have been your books. And um, one of the things that I've, I've read them mostly in English. When I can get them, I read them in Spanish. Um, but I was wondering if you work with your translators. I mean, your English is perfectly fluent. Um, so you certainly are in a position to work with your translators. And you write with such, your writing in <laughs> Spanish is so charming and poetic and spiritual. And you're, your translators also seem to do a wonderful job, and I'm wondering if you work with them at all and what you think of the translations of your, particularly Eva Luna and the stories of Eva Luna. Well, thank you. I have had the same. I'm only on page 112. <laughs> <laughs> I have had the same translator for all my books except The House of the Spirits and Maya. Um, my translator was Margaret Sawyer Peden. And we had a psychic connection. She, I think she improves my books. And um, she would send me every 20 or 30 pages that I could go line by line. So I was on top of every detail of the translation. But then when she, would, she was going to translate this book, she was 84 years old. And she said, I can't get the, the voice of a 19-year-old girl from Berkeley. I can't. And she had had an aneurysm. She wasn't feeling well. So we looked for another translator. My editor in HarperCollins looked for the translator. We found a wonderful person.
but it took so long that by the time the book was finished, it was a historical novel. <laughs> yeah, because when it, when it was published in Spanish, it was very contemporary. It was 2010. And now it's three years old. Yeah. There's a hand over and there. And there's one over there. If you can get the mic back there, and we'll take one over on this side now. Um, am I on? Okay, great. Um, I read your uh, responses in Datebook. San Francisco Chronicle had you on the front page of Datebook yesterday, I think it was. And there was um, information in there, I think, about your grandchildren maybe suffering from, uh, did I misread that? Um, suffering from? So I, I may have misread something. Um, I wasn't sure whether, I'm asking if the drug addiction is something that touched your life personally with people that you knew and, is one question. If drug addiction is something yeah, yeah. that has okay. touched Okay, because I thought I read that in, in date yeah. book that you yeah. talked about that. And, and um, there's a book, I believe it's called Beautiful Boy, and the father who wrote it talked about how drug addiction is yes. something that yes. affects only certain people. You know, if you try drugs, certain people are going to become addicted pretty much right away. Did, were you thinking about that at all in terms of why Maya became drug addicted as opposed to just you know, playing with drugs, enjoying them like enjoying them, like yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> kids her age, and was that something that was in your mind when you well, were creating her? Unfortunately, it is in my family. We have had the experience of addiction. When I married Willie, my American husband, he had three biological children, two already adults, but one that was 10 years old. And all his children are addicted and two of them have already died of addiction, of drug addiction. One of them died four weeks ago. And so my family is grieving right now. So it has touched us as a family in terrible ways because one of the awful things about this is that there's nothing that you can do. Um, you can love them, you can give them structure, you can try to help, you can force them into rehab. You can do whatever. With the little one, the one that just died, that is, was 35 when he died, I, I met him when he was 10, a little boy. Um, we tried everything. And I say we because I was involved also in a way. He, he went to a school in Oregon when he was 13. The school is here in the book. All the experience of Maya is what Harley lived. And I wrote about it years ago when I wrote The Sum of Our Days. And he didn't want to be in the book. So I, I had to rewrite the book and take out 50 pages with Harley's story. Unfortunately, I destroyed the pages, which one should never destroy anything. Everything is recyclable. <laughs> <clears throat> but when I wrote this book, I remembered. And I went back to the stories that I had lived and the stories that he had told me. And that's that moment in the book when Maya is in a public bathroom dying and he hears the voice of his grandfather saying, breathe, Maya, breathe. And she sees the shoes of her grandfather under the door. That Harley told me that. He told me that he saw his sister. He was in a public bathroom dying. And he heard his sister's voice. His sister was already dead. And the sister saying, breathe, Harley, breathe. And she saw his sister's shoes. So I remember that because it's, it's stuck in my mind as, as there are no boundaries between the other world and this world. Who saved Harley in that moment? The memory of his sister? I don't know what saved him. But, but his sister was there for him as Popo is there for Maya in that moment. So yes, uh, drug addiction has been very close to, uh, to me. Back there? Oh, sorry. Um, I grew up in the Bay Area, and I know that while it aspires towards a sort of normative multiculturalism, Berkeley High is a particularly self-segregated school. So I was wondering, um, I mean, that's a loaded statement, so feel free to push back. But um, I was wondering what role race played in um, Maya's identity or what inspired Maya for you. What inspired Maya? 
what inspired her approach to her own racial identity? I don't understand. Or racial identity. What, how, <coughs> how did my, I think you're say, asking, how did my identify her own ethnicity, right? Yeah, and it, how do you think that the Bay Area and her experience of it factored into? Well, in, in that sense, the book is very multicultural because the, the grandmother is a Chilean immigrant who falls in love with an African-American man. The, the father of the girl is from Chilean origin. His father and his mother are Chilean, but he's, he lives in the United States. He's a, he's a pilot in the United States, and he falls in love with a Danish woman. And so Maya is the product of this Chilean man with this Danish woman in the United States. She has the looks of the mother. She looks very Scandinavian, but she has been raised by a tough grandmother from Chile. So she has the Chilean mentality in many ways. So there's all kinds of, um, of in interracial um, stories in the book. And then she goes back to live with indigenous people in Chiloé. Mm -hmm. Any questions on this side, since there is a mic over there? And there's one, one question in the here. Also. Oh, back there, OK. Um, are you going to be making a movie? Because you should. If they're, <laughs> if they're making a movie with who? <laughs> and can I star in it? I, I didn't hear. Can, can you repeat it? I didn't hear it. If you're making a movie, and can I star in it? Because I'd be pretty good. I don't hear are you star. making a movie and what? <laughs> and could she star in the movie? <laughs> I want Penelope Cruz to represent me. <laughs> <laughs> and Antonio Banderas should course. be the, the father of Maya, right? Yeah. Antonio Banderas. Yeah. Why, why would I put myself, you can, if I can have Penelope Cruz, are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> but the, I, I, I mean, the book just came out in English, and I have not had anybody talk about the movie. Uh, there, I have been approached for several of my other books. And after spending a fortune in lawyers and years back and forth with contracts, I can't sign the contracts because Hollywood wants everything. They want the rights to do whatever they please with the book forever. In this universe and universes to be discovered, in this technology, I'm not kidding, not kidding. For this technology and whatever technology may be invented in the future, this is in the contract. They are this thick, the contracts. And also they want the copyright of the characters. So if I use my own characters in a book in the future, I have to pay them a royalty. No, I can't sign that. But now there is, the, for, for other circumstances, they are making the movie of Zorro and maybe the movie of City of the Beasts because they are not, I mean, the City of the Beasts is not an American producer because it's, it's, Hollywood is crazy. Crazy. <laughs> Question over there? Yep. Hola, buenas noches. Just one thing. They are not making any movies, but in a couple of weeks, we have the premiere of an opera in Los Angeles with Placido Domingo, <laughs> with one of my stories of Eva Luna. My question was, do you ever write in English or do you always write in Spanish? I can write non-fiction in English, but fiction happens in the belly, not in the brain. <laughs> and uh, so it, it's, it's like dreaming, like fighting with my husband. It's in Spanish. <laughs> ah, and making love, too. I would feel so ridiculous panting in English. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I have good translators. <laughs> Do you ever have a writer's block? I mean, many, many, uh, I mean, you mentioned in the book that writing is really like riding a bicycle. You know, once you learn, you just get on and, and go. Uh, but many of us suffer from what we call writer's block. So what's the analogy there? Is having a bicycle with the brakes on, or you get on and you realize you have cramps in go. your legs? <laughs> Or know where to go, or you yeah. go around. I have had writer's block only once, 
after my daughter died. Um, I, after she died, I wrote a memoir called Paula. And after that, I, want, I was dry. I, I couldn't write anything for three years. And I was once in Book Passage, in the bookstore in Marin, and um, Annie Lamotte was there. And she said, how are you doing? And I said, not good, because I can't write. I'm, I'm in a writer's block. And she said, there is no such a thing as a writer's block. Your reservoirs are empty. Fill them up. And I realized that she was absolutely right. Right, I felt dry inside. And my friend, Tabra, who made this necklace, by the way, <laughs> and, uh, and my husband took me to India. And in India, I sort of woke up to the suffering and the beauty, to the contrast of everything. And um, I, I sort of got over the, this numbness of being empty. And I came back and I wrote Daughter of Fortune. Mm -hmm. I think it was Daughter of Fortune, I don't remember. Over there? <laughs> <clears throat> Hi, um, some of your earlier books, and I think your, in general, have been classified as magical realism. Mm -hmm. um, and how does this book fit into that or not fit into that? <laughs> Magic realism is everything that we cannot explain or buy, or control. Um, the world is so complicated, so rich, so mysterious. <laughs> Things happen in so many levels. Uh, there is, uh, I think that magic realism is just accepting all what we don't know, the possibility of what we, can, we don't know. And that makes m my life richer. And of course, it's a great literary device. It's very interesting because when, when magical things or superstition happens to us in the United States, it's perfectly acceptable. It's called New Age. <laughs> when it, yeah, and, and if it's a belief, then it's religion. When it happens abroad, it's superstition and magic realism. <laughs> yeah, English is language. The rest are dialects. <laughs> so I think we have to be more open to that. In this book, there is all the mythology of Chiloé, which is very specific to that place. And because it's a community of people who live off the sea, they're fishermen, it, has, it is a mythology that has to do with water, mostly. But it's very magical, and people don't admit that they believe in these magical things, but no one would walk at night without bringing some salt and a knife. Because what if a black dog without an ear appears in front of you? That's the devil. So you have to throw, sprinkle some salt and make the cross with a, with a knife, and the, the devil will go away. Now, here, we don't go under a ladder. Or if there is a black cat somewhere, we get spooked out. So it depends. I think that there's magic in everything. I find that there's magic in my life all the time. And coincidences and premonitions and prophetic dreams and, and the feeling that, that I've been in a place, that I know this person, that I've heard this story before. I think we all have those experiences, but we sort of de deny them because we can't explain them. And who cares? I care. I'm open to it. Some questions over here? Hi, uh, I read your book, and well, I'm a Chilean too, so I really enjoyed it. Uh, and so um, I'm, I wanted to ask you more about the, the part in Vegas. Like, how did you manage Ima? In all that. <laughs> so the it's parts of, La of the, Vegas? Yeah. Well, the girl, when the girl runs away from home, she's picked up by a truck driver. Something horrible happens on the way, and she ends up, the, the truck driver leaves her in Vegas. Why did I choose that place? Because it's an artificial city born in the desert whose main objective or goal is entertainment. It's noise, it's lights, it's shows, 
It's gambling, it's money. And it is the heart, not only of gambling, but also prostitution um, and many other things. And so it's with a very corrupt police, apparently. So that's perfect for a novel. <laughs> yeah. It's a perfect place. The perfect place that could be a descent into hell in the perfect scenario, in the perfect theater. And why did I take it to Chiloé? Because Chiloé is exactly the opposite. It's, it could, it, it's like, it's a place where there is no noise, where there's no entertainment, where there's just life, work, relationships. That's it. And, and I needed to exaggerate the, the stimulation for Maya, the fact that she's so, um, so exposed to everything. Everything is so raw and so brutal. So I thought Vegas is the perfect place. And I hope there's nobody from Vegas here. In any case, I'm not going in the tour to Las Vegas, so it's fine. Um, you just mentioned that uh, the contrast between uh, Chiloé and Las Vegas. Um, I have another question here that came from Chiloé. And um, this is Teófilo, Teófilo Cárdenas asked, I would like to ask you how you, Isabel, imagine that the development of fundamental values should be kept here in Chiloé. I ask because you refer to this place as a refuge. And that is in the contact that connects us to nature, but that is every day becoming more and more scarce. That's true. So do you have any uh, sense of uh, what might happen with Chiloé given some changes that are occurring there? I have friends who moved to Chiloé 40 years ago or 30 years ago when Chiloé was a sort of, sort of paradise. But we have to be very careful with paradise and idealizing the place because in these isolated places there is domestic violence, unemployment, alcoholism, uh, incest, all kinds of awful stuff happen that are not so visible. But the landscape is fantastic. And in general, life is wonderful. So they, that's why they have moved there. But in the 30 years that have gone by, the, of course the place has changed. Now everybody has a, cellu a cellular phone. And when there is a signal, everybody has internet. So all that is available. The, there is a ferry that connects uh, the, the main island with the continent. And now they are thinking of building a bridge. That and, is part of the question. Yeah, that and, and the people yeah. who live in the big island don't want the bridge right. because it will bring everything that they don't want from Chile, it will come to Chiloé. Yeah. So of course, the, these places that are isolated sooner or later get incorporated to what we have here. Mm -hmm. But I think that more and more people in the world and very special in the United States, are aware that this kind of life is unsustainable, that, that we need to make profound changes. It's in the air or under the surface. I don't know where it is, but I have that clear feeling, and I travel a lot, so I perceive this, <coughs> especially among young people, this desire, this uh, longing for another kind of life, a kind of life where we are in touch with nature, where things are sustainable, where relationships are true and not virtual. My grandchildren, for example, are connected to 600 friends in Facebook, but there's nobody there to hold their hands when they need them. We have all this dating, blind dating in the internet, and when the, you get to meet the guy, if you, if you ever do, they are awful <laughs> because because everything is fake, it's, it's, it's not real. Mm. Relationships d don't become real. Mm. How can it be possible that I'm in the same house with my granddaughter and she's texting me? Yeah. <laughs> Why can't she walk from the dining room to my room? <laughs> she's texting me. Yeah. So I think that, that this, is cha this will change. This is like peaking and it will change. Mm. And what we are doing to the planet is unsustainable. Mm -hmm. And life is unsustainable the way we are dealing with it. It's crazy. Who's happy? Who's happy with this? I don't know, maybe some CEO that has a yacht somewhere, but most people are not. Mm. 
Uh, oh, but let's take the one back there. We haven't been on this side. Hi, good evening. Well, thank you for coming and um, having this presentation. We're really excited to have you um, on behalf of the students, too. And I just have the question of, you were talking about the importance of, um, you, you said prophetic visions and dreams. So I kind of want to know, for you, what's the importance of that in your process of writing, of creativity? So that's something that really um, triggered something for me. So I want to know more about how that kind of happens for you. Well, in my job, I am quiet, silent, alone for long periods of time, like a monk. Anybody who has that kind of experience starts seeing and hearing voices or something. <laughs> you could be institutionalized for that if you don't write or do something creative with it. But if I am, during the time that I'm writing, I'm so concentrated on the writing, on the characters, on the story, that I start, I have them all the time inside me, living with me. And then I have dreams, and the dreams tell me about the book. They are not prophetic dreams, but they are um, dreams that reveal something. They are like revelations. For example, when I'm writing, and only when I'm writing, I have dreams of babies. And what happens to the baby in the dream, I have learned in time, that is happening to the book in real life. So for example, I dream with a baby that cries with the voice of an old man. Then I, I wake up in the middle of the night and I make a note of the dream because otherwise I forget it. And then the next day, I read my text to see, to look for the voice. Is the narrative voice correct? Is this character talking with a real voice that would be appropriate for that character? Or is he talking like me? So the, the dream reveals to me something because I pay attention. We all dream, but we don't have time to stop to see what we, to, to know what we, the dreams are about. Or the patience to make a little note, write them down in your computer or someplace, and after some time, you see the pattern. You see the imagery that repeats itself, the recurrent dreams. And then you start understanding what your unconscious world is trying to give you, the gifts that come from that hidden place inside that we all have. So when we talk about magical realism, is, is it magic? If you ask any per person from, a tr from any tribe, any indigenous person, they will tell you that there's nothing magical about it, that nature speaks to them, that they can see what the, the spirit of the stones talking to them, that they can, in dreams, communicate with their ancestors. So all that, that, that is part of who we are as humans. As, it's part of nature. It's part of life. And we have compartmented everything, separated ourselves from everything that is holistic. And we live in a world that is rational and a world that we can control. Otherwise, we feel terribly insecure. What science does, it, what science is wonderful. And more and more science today is opening up to other possibilities. But, but science and, and all the things that we've learned on technology put things up in, as objects. And they are all separated. In the real world, everything is connected. Why don't we take another one from the back there, since the mic is nearby? I thought I saw two hands, no? OK. Uh, then one over any one of these here. <laughs> Hello there. Um, speaking of magical realism, um, I am from Las Vegas, Nevada. <laughs> and Sorry. You have to repeat the whole thing. And. Um, I actually got lost, and I wound up at the Berkeley Law School, uh, which I plan to attend sometime in the future. So I came in, and I was taking some pictures, and I ran into a woman who asked me where this auditorium was. I said, I don't know, but I looked up on the wall, and I said, oh, it's down here. I said, are you going somewhere fun? 
She said, I'm going to this. So I read it. And when I read it, it said, I'm reading it, because I actually haven't read a book in a really long time. But, um, and then it said Las Vegas. So now I'm here. <laughs> and I love magical realism. So I want to say thank you so much for putting it out there and being honest and being real and sharing that with everyone. And thank you from the bottom of my heart well, for, thank you for me coming. being here. Thank you for stumbling into this. <laughs> okay. okay, we're only going to take uh, three more questions. So one back there and then two over here. There's several hands over there. If the questions are brief, we can maybe do five. Maybe brief, maybe we can get four in. <laughs> Is it on? Oh. Okay, Isabel, it's a, it's a pleasure este, escucharte. Um, I grew up reading your books, and you know, it's just it's, I would never imagine that I would have the opportunity to listen to you. Um, my question is, how do you deal um, as a woman, as a Chilean woman, as a Latina woman, with the machismo in in just I I I don't know maybe in the in the culture in the industry when dealing as an artist? Um, yeah, that was my question. How do I Gracias. Deal? Te queremos. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, things have changed for the better. Uh, I was a feminist before the word was invented. I must have been around five years old when I realized that my mother was a victim of my grandfather, my uncles, of the males in the family, of the society. I realized that I didn't want to be like her. I wanted to be like my grandfather. I wanted to be powerful and independent. So that was that was called being a brat and being punished for. <laughs> then later, feminists came, and, it, and I wasn't alone. There was a lot of people that were thinking like what I was, or feeling what I was feeling. And I have seen in my life all what feminism has done, all the improvement of the situation of women in most of the world, especially the Western world. And I have also seen how much is there to be done, that how much more we need to do. What, what's, what happens in Asia, in Africa, even in the United States among people who are uneducated, there's a lot of violence against women everywhere. So I have a foundation that my, my daughter-in-law, Lori, who's sitting there, runs. And the foundation's mission is to help women and girls, empowering women and girls, because there's a lot to do in the world still. In my job, when I was working for a boss, of course I felt that I didn't have the same opportunities that any of the men that were way less, uh, less intelligent, less smart, <laughs> even less good looking than I. They would get all the chances and not me. And I did all the work. And today, even today, you see that women do the work and men get the, jo the high jobs. Men give the orders and women do the job. But it's changing. So I think that my granddaughters have a much better chance than I ever did. In the, in the area of literature, women in South America, in Latin America, are never respected. You have to do double the effort than any man to get half the recognition. But that is also changing, and it's not the case in the United States, where almost as many women writers are published as men. And women read more fiction than men. So there is a readership out there, an audience, that wants to read women. So that gives me a good chance. <laughs> Over there. Hello, I wanted to ask you, uh, as Chilean and also as a Chilean living in the United States for a while, when you are writing your books, what is the audience that you are thinking of? And, and related to that, what's the legacy that you would like to leave with your books? Oh, my dear. First of all, <laughs> first of all, legacy is a penis word. Women don't think in terms of legacy. It's just a male thing. I'll be dead. I'll be cremated, 
my ashes will be thrown in the toilet. <laughs> and there is no legacy. No, the, how? No, why bother my, my children taking Take ashes all the way to Chile in a united flight? Give me a break. <laughs> Just throw them in the toilet. So there is no legacy. I think the legacy is the, the common, is the, is the contribution to the collective culture, to the collective unconscious, to our collective dreams. We all contribute somehow. And that is the legacy that we have. The rest is all just vanity. And who is my audience? When I write, my audience are my characters. I, I, I talk to them. I write. I, I need to write the stories that they are telling me. And I don't think of the reviews, of what my agent is going to think, of how the book is going to be received, or who is going to read it. So I'm always surprised that the book, my, all my books have been well received, always. But, and I've been, I'm obsessed with this thing. I just read a story by, by Nathan Englander. And it's a collection of stories. The book is called uh, What We Talk About When We Talk About Anne Frank. And it is a collection of Jewish stories. And there is one story there called The Reader. I had it photocopied, and I have it on the wall. It is the story of a best-selling author, 10 years later, <coughs> who writes another book, and nobody reads it. He goes to the, to the readings, the empty rooms. There's not even the barista is there to give him a cup of coffee. He, they gave him instant coffee, and he's in a warehouse signing books that nobody will buy. And there's only one person that comes to the readings, and it's the, the only reader that he has. And he goes in his car from town to town, trying to sell his books, and the reader goes behind in his car. <laughs> so he shows up in every reading, and he has to read the same thing for the same guy every time. It's a, it's a nightmare. That's my nightmare. That <laughs> nobody will show up. <laughs> okay. okay. I think we're going to stop because uh, Is Isabel is losing her voice. But <laughs> if we can, we have a little surprise for you. So if we could just pull the curtains, please. And I will read this. Last night. Oh, it's a male stripper. Or it's a male stripper. <laughs> <laughs> Um, late, late last night, um, late last night, I got a one-minute uh, video, and it came with this note: "Dear Beatrice, with much affection, don't show it yet. With much affection, this <coughs> sunny April afternoon that was yesterday, we have prepared a message for Isabel Allende. She's such an admired and widely read writer." by our Chilote youngsters. I hope it conveys to her the emotion of these young people, the sound of the waves, the brilliance of the sun, the bells from the centenary churches, and so many island rumors that we possess around here. The students who participated are Carlos, Cristian, Tamara, Daida from junior, uh, junior year, Carla, Francisca, Felipe, and Beatriz from the senior year, and the teachers Claudia and Wilson. To you, Beatriz, a fraternal hug and our thanks for giving us this beautiful opportunity. From Castro, Chiloé, Marcela, Zabaleta, Caicheo, teacher Galvarino Rivero Cárdenas High School. How beautiful.
I would propose that we send a wave to them yeah. back there. Yeah. Ciao, hola. <laughs> that was very beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabel, for she whoops. A stripper. <laughs> that was a stripper she wanted.